Welcome to Insight. Uh, today we come a very, very special way, coming to you from the UWI's regional headquarters here at the UWI HQ on Mona, Jamaica. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the regional headquarters of the University of the West Indies. A very warm welcome to the visiting team from the University of Glasgow, as well as to members of the media and others tuning in to this event, which is being broadcast on our university's public information channel, UWI TV. My name is Vereen Shepherd, and true to my name, I will be shepherding you through this historic uh, ceremony, the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the University of the West Indies and the University of Glasgow and the establishment of the Glasgow Caribbean Center for Development Research. I recognize the presence of Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the UWI, and Lady Mary Beckles, Dr. David Duncan, Chief Operating Officer and University Secretary and Chair, History of Slavery Committee, University of Glasgow, Mr. Peter Aitchison, Director of Communications and Public Affairs, University of Glasgow. I welcome our Registrar, Mr. C. William Eiton, Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Denzel Williams, Pro Vice Chancellor, Ambassador, Dr. Richard Bernal, Professor Julie Meeks, Meeks Gardner, Deputy Principal of the UWI, Mrs. Glyn Manley, widow of the Honorable Michael Manley, former Prime Minister of Jamaica. I recognize the presence of other members of the executive management team of the UWI, including our legal counsel, deans and directors of the UWI, members of the reparation and Pan-African movements, members of staff of the UWI, the viewing audience on UWI TV and JNN, and members of the media around the world. We are gathered here to witness a historic act the signing of an MOU between the UWI and the University of Glasgow, the former the site of a plantation owned by people from Britain on which Africans were enslaved and Indians indentured, the latter an institution that benefited from the proceeds of the labor of enslaved Africans, the former the site of activism around the search for repatriate justice, especially through the new Center for Reparation Research, the latter, the site of activism around a response to the calls for repatriate justice. Indeed, Glasgow is the only university in the UK thus far to commit to a repatriate justice program in light of its own extraction of slave-produced wealth from the Caribbean, although others are, shall we say, still looking into the matter. While the demand for repatriate justice for the Maangamizi, colonialism, and its continuing legacies in the Caribbean have mostly been ignored by complicit states, institutions and individuals are stepping forward and joining that other Me Too movement and talking reparation. Such talks have been taking place between these two institutions for months now and we are about to learn the outcome of these conversations. At the end of the announcement of the outcome, some may sing Newton's Amazing Grace. Others will no doubt chant down Babylon. This creative tension will generate even more conversations as the center refines its mandate and plans the strategies around which repatriate justice will be dispensed to ensure that in this decade for people of African descent, the interests of people of African descent on both sides of the Atlantic will be truly served. I now inv I invite first the Vice Chancellor of the UWI and secondly, Dr. Duncan of the University of Glasgow to make their own introductory statements. VC. Professor Shepherd, it is my honor this day to welcome everyone to this historic event. 
It is a single but seminal moment in the global movement for reparatory justice, and I'm pleased to invite your participation. It is a powerful, practical gesture and significant symbolic stage in the journey that seeks fairness and fellowship for the descendants of enslaved Africans. It is for the Caribbean the first formal reparations response to the crimes of enslavement and post-emancipation plunder committed against African people in the region and beyond. I am proud this morning to welcome to the regional headquarters of the University of the West Indies two senior officials of the University of Glasgow, Dr. David Duncan, Chief Operations Officer, and Dr. Peter Aitchinson, Director of Communications and Public Affairs, both representing Vice Chancellor Professor Sir Anton Muscatali, who must this day be celebrated for his visionary leadership of the University of Glasgow. The community of historians in the Caribbean and in Scotland have long been aware of the role played by the city of Glasgow in the development and sustainability of African enslavement in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Likewise, they have been aware of the financial support given by enslavers in the Caribbean to the ancient University of Glasgow. But it was Vice Chancellor Muscatelli who launched a formal inquiry in the exact dimensions of endowments which the university received from owners and managers of slave produced wealth. This report provides an ethical context and an empirical basis for this partnership between the University of the West Indies and the University of Glasgow, which we shall launch this day with the signing of a memorandum of understanding. The Vice Chancellor and his research team, led by my colleague, Dr. David Duncan, have responded in a principled and purposeful manner to the evidence unearthed and presented in their report. They have not done as many universities with a similar engagement with slave produced wealth have done, that is to research and run. Research and run has indeed become the norm for many universities in Britain, Europe and North America. Rather than stand and plan, they research and run. Not so with the University of Glasgow. It has provided for a partnership with the University of the West Indies, which is cast within a framework of reparatory justice for victims of slavery and colonization. Importantly, it has insisted that the partnership represents a commitment to fund the search for development solutions for the people of the Caribbean as they continue to battle with the debilitating legacies of slavery and colonization. Officials have accepted the principles laid out in the CARICOM Reparations Commission's 10-point plan that see reparations as part of a broad development strategy for victimized communities long in need of practical and promotional support. Neither did they seek with sanitized words to apologize and fossilize the culture of indifference that has greeted for generations the plight of the victims of slavery. It has never been morally sufficient to issue apologies and refuse to repair, to issue words of regret and then reject any policy of repair. Apologize and fossilize is here rejected in favor of apologies and the need to mobilize. Our colleagues at Glasgow have recognized that universities such as their own 
can never be truly excellent unless they are also ethical. And that in order to prepare for the future, they must repair the past in the present. In this regard, the MOU we are about to sign will bind the mind of the University of the West Indies and the University of Glasgow. We have agreed to jointly establish and manage an institution for collaborative research action that will mobilize historical knowledge to be galvanized to meet the development needs of the Caribbean and Africa. This institution will be called the Glasgow Caribbean Center for Development Research. <coughs> its collaborative research agenda will revolve around broad areas and issues of public health, development, economics, and cultural empowerment, and related themes and subjects. The University of Glasgow has agreed to contribute 20 million pounds to the center to fund its operations and research programs over the next two decades. The center will be administered by a joint board and its activities and allocations guided by the principle of reparatory justice. Colleagues, friends, and well wishers, we seek your support for this reparatory justice initiative and institution two fine universities rooted in a common history have decided to come together to contribute to the repair of the communities by so doing the best they can to shed light where there has been darkness and critically to plan the best they can for transformation and development in this long exploited Caribbean region. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sir Hillary. May I just start by saying thanks to Sir Hillary and Lady Beckles and all the colleagues at UWI for your generous hospitality this week. And I'm really sorry that Sir Anton Muscatelli, uh, my boss, my vice chancellor, uh, can't be with us today, but he will be at the follow up signing in Glasgow in, in three weeks' time. Uh, th the main reason we're here, as the Vice Chancellor said, is to um, sign this uh, Memorandum of Understanding, which is going to be a partnership, a, a collaboration between our universities, rooted for us in the spirit of reparative justice. The intention of the MOU is to be as honest as we can about the past, but also to be forward-looking, uh, to respect the differences, uh, different experiences that we've had historically, but also to establish a true partnership. Now, we're here representing uh, the University of Glasgow, which is the, the fourth oldest university in the English-speaking world. It was established by the Pope way back in 1451, and its history runs right the way through uh, the, the Northern European Renaissance, the Reformation, the Civil War, the Jacobite Risings, the Agricultural and the Industrial Revolutions, and of course, the wars of the, the 20th century. But part of our history uh, relates to the 18th and 19th century, when as a university we benefited from the proceeds of slavery and the slave trade, which of course left such an indelible mark on the Caribbean and other parts of the world. There are, we should say, many aspects of, of our university's history that we are proud of. Uh, our faculty, our university uh, academics campaigned to end slavery in the late 18th century. They petitioned the, 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 the UK Parliament. We hosted Adam Smith, who was a professor at the University of Glasgow, who of course condemned slavery in his book uh, the Wealth of Nations, and we gave William Wilberforce uh, an honorary degree when it wasn't particularly fashionable to do so, and, and in opposition, actually, from, from the local uh, traders and merchants of the city of Glasgow. But at the same time, we also, in the 18th and 19th centuries, accepted gifts from individuals uh, who had been enriched by slavery, and those gifts helped to fund scholarships at our university, and they helped to build the new buildings, um, especially those put up in the 1860s when the university moved to a new campus in the, the west end of the city. So four years ago, uh, our vice chancellor and principal commissioned research into the university's relationship with slavery and the slave trade, and that report was published in September of last year. And the report found, in, in essence, that the University of Glasgow had benefited by up to 198 million pounds at today's values uh, from donations either by those involved in the slave trade or from their descendants through the 19th century. 
And that includes, I should say, bequests by many who were compensated after 1834 by the British Treasury. So how has the report been received? Well, it's, it's been received, I think, very positively around, around the world. Um, and I think that's been for four main reasons. Um, firstly, because it's grounded in high quality academic research, mainly by uh, my colleagues, Professor Simon Newman and Dr. Stephen Mullen. Um, secondly, because it benefited from external advice and uh, Sir Hillary was, was one of the key advisors on the project, also Sir Jeff Palmer, a professor in, in Scotland of, of Jamaican origin and Graham Campbell, who was uh, another uh, British Jamaican um, who is, is on the city council in Glasgow. Thirdly, I think the commitment of senior managers at uh, University of Glasgow, particularly uh, our principal and vice chancellor, uh, who was ready to say sorry for the way that the University of Glasgow benefited. And then fourthly, um, we were willing, I think, to be open and transparent about the historical evidence and to publish the report and let people make up their own minds about the evidence. So for us, um, this is a question about how we address the past. We, we can't go back and change it, but we can engage, as Sir Hilary said, in a program of, of reparative justice, which I suppose goes some way to, to repair it or to atone for it, and also has a positive benefit looking, uh, benefit looking forward. The program of activities that we've identified includes uh, awareness raising in, in the UK and internationally, scholarships for, for students from minority ethnic backgrounds, further research on, on slavery and its consequences, and of course, as you've already heard, uh, collaboration with the University of the West Indies and other institutions around the world in countries affected by, by slavery. The recommendations in the report are already being implemented, and the signing of this MOU today represents the fulfillment of one of those nine key recommendations. So it will, as, as you've already heard, involve us as a university committing resources, which we have to earn through uh, teaching and research activities. Looking outside the university, it's not for us, we don't think, to tell others how to address their history, but we have made it clear that we're willing to share our experience and our expertise, and indeed we're already doing that. Uh, Stephen Mullen, who helped to write this report, has been engaged on a project by the city of Glasgow, and a number of us have been in touch with other universities in the UK who are interested in doing similar projects. So we're delighted that the University of, of the West Indies is willing to work with us. Uh, the Vice Chancellor has already identified two possible areas that we can focus on, and we'll be discussing more over the coming weeks. We see this as a long-term and enduring relationship which can benefit future generations in these islands and, and around the world. The collaboration will be multidisciplinary, running right across the, the faculties and departments of both universities. And we'll draw on expertise from history, from science, from social sciences, public health, medical expertise, and perhaps other disciplines too. So the signing of the MOU today for us is, is only a beginning. Uh, we'll be more than happy to update the press and the public, and of course our own university communities in the years ahead as we progress it. And we're very gr grateful for the hospitality that we've received and to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, Dr. Duncan. And before I call on our University Council to preside over the MOU signing, allow me to welcome our, the principal of the Mona campus, PVC, um, Professor Dale Weber. So, we are at a very historic moment now. Well, the whole thing is historic anyway. And I invite Mrs. Lolita Davis Mattis and the uh, registrar of the UWI, as well as Mr. Peter, Peter Aitchison, to come. And the registrar and Mr. Aitchison will well, witness the signing, and the VC and Dr. Duncan will sign.
morning, friends and colleagues, and greetings to the speakers and to the media attending this press conference, and to all those viewing the live stream of this event on UETV. First, on behalf of my colleagues at the National African American Reparations Commission, good morning, friends and colleagues, and greetings to the speakers and to the media attending this press conference and to all those viewing the live stream of this event on UETV. First, on behalf of my colleagues at the National African American Reparations Commission, and also on my own behalf, allow me to congratulate both the University of the West Indies and the University of Glasgow on signing this historic Memorandum of Understanding to establish a joint Caribbean Center for Development Research. Kudos to UWI's Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Decades of political sovereignty in our region have yet to fully overcome the living legacies of enslavement and colonialism, which are manifested in persistent poverty, in growing economic inequalities among the highs in the world, unfortunately, and in public health crises, just diabetes and hypertension to cite two examples that confront the peoples of the Caribbean. The Center for Development Research will help to provide the historical and intellectual basis for new and innovative public policy prescriptions that regional governments can study and adopt as necessary for sustainable models of overall social economic and political development. In order to chart a course for a bright future for our Caribbean, we must operate from a deep knowledge and understanding of our collective past as a regional civilization and our collective destiny and future as a group of independent states that are geographically within the same region. The work of this research center will complement the ongoing work of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, whose 10-point program for reparatory justice enjoys widespread international support and has inspired the creation of, a te of the 10-point program of the National African American Reparations Commission. I'm delighted to learn that the MOU calls for joint efforts by both parties to, uh, to attract external funding for mutually agreed upon projects that will benefit both the Caribbean and other parts of the world that have been negatively affected by the transatlantic slave trade. Chattel slavery was a criminal global economic enterprise spanning more than 300 years and the collective wealth produced by uncompensated labor laid the basis for today's global economic system of neoliberalism that continues to reproduce severe economic disparities and imbalances in the countries where chattel slavery once existed. Reparatory solutions for the damages done by the African enslavement must therefore be global in nature. I'm sure that this center will contribute enormously to an expanding public awareness, a global public awareness of the systemic and structural connections between the history of enslavement and colonialism and the development challenges of today. Its work of connecting the dots between the past and the present could not be more timely and relevant. Finally, congrats again to the authors of this momentous initiative, which I'm confident will resonate far and wide and will inspire and encourage advocates for reparatory justice around the world. Thank you. Honorable Prime Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to send you greetings from London as you are launch this initiative between University of Glasgow and University of West Indies to mark, I'm sure, many months of very hard work between our Vice Chancellors and their respective management teams. When Sir Hillary became Vice Chancellor, I'll he announced one of his major themes would be that of the globalization of UWI. And we at BFUWI were very excited by that 
prospect because based here in London it can be a bit isolating. Uh, but we thought that we would be able to play an important role in uh, establishing closer ties between the UK universities and, uh, and Europe as a whole. We have been very uh, lucky in this regard to have great support from our Caribbean High Commissioners here in London um, who are actually patrons of BFUWI and who allow us to use their facilities uh, very generously. More particularly, I'd like to say a special thank you to the government of Barbados and successive governments of Barbados who have allowed us to have our headquarters at the Barbados High Commission on Great Russell Street. That has been an enormous benefit to us and their staff have always been tremendously helpful and are very supportive of our endeavours. We have established ties, most notably with those universities who already have a strong connection with the Caribbean, so those who have Caribbean studies departments. We forge very close ties with the University of Coventry and a memorandum of understanding will be launched soon. Uh, we're also working on, I should say, a link with the University of Bristol where the University of the West Indies will assist in teacher training. One of our main uh, strategies has been a focus on the life chances of our Caribbean students here in the UK because long before the Windrush scandal, before it was even called the Windrush scandal, we recognised, the because we live here, the hardship and the difficulties faced by not only our adults but our young people. Another exciting venture that we've been working on uh, with Sir Hillary has been the establishing ties with an institution uh, in Europe because Brexit uh, presents dangers and opportunities for the Caribbean and we must be ready at institutional, governmental and business uh, levels to deal with the difficulties that we may encounter. We hope that by forging links with a university based in Europe uh, and setting up a Caribbean Institute on the mainland instead of simply here in London, we will be able to assist Caribbean governments, Caribbean institutions, Caribbean businesses particularly in their task of developing the Caribbean region by providing our data to the European Union on individual islands but also assisting European, assisting Caribbean governments in knowing who to turn to in Europe if, when they need help because it's time that we recognise the need to wean ourselves off the colonial link that has tied us to going to Europe via London. We don't really need to do that and we won't be able to do that in the coming months and years. Uh, so you can see there are a number of initiatives in the pipeline which are, in which you and BFEWI play a part and we hope that there will be exciting new developments on the horizon for our region and for our university. There are moments in history that are not mere moments, but events fixed in time with continuing repercussions. One such moment has been the period of enslavement of millions of Africans. It has been one of the worst atrocities in the history of humankind. Today is a moment in history, one which I hope will become a defining event in the process of reparation for the atrocities of the transatlantic trade in Africans. For here, we have today two noble higher learning institutions, the University of Glasgow and the University of the West Indies, coming together to make a statement to the globe that reparations is possible. The University of Glasgow has been a beneficiary of the transatlantic trade. Its own research reveals that it received gifts and bequeaths from benefactors connected to the enslavement of Africans with an emphasis on profits coming out of Jamaica. But through today's activity, it acknowledges its role and expresses a determination to make things right. The signing of this MOU is a new experience. It is a beginning. I applaud both universities for this significant move, which forms part of the general application of reparation as a way to redress wrongs and to achieve peace and reconciliation. This move sets a clear precedent for others to follow. It is more than a conscience call. 
It is a global example of reparatory justice. Of course, the policy and practice of reparatory justice has been a feature of Caribbean European jurisprudence and history for over two centuries, more so by those of us who still reel from the impacts of a period that some would want to forget. But we cannot forget, not even one single action under that system, which was designed to strip our people of their very humanity. And we dare not forget the struggles of the ancestors who fought and defeated that system. As we celebrate this moment in history, I must emphasize, especially on the eve of the 181st anniversary of emancipation, that this act by the University of Glasgow does not absolve the country in which it is located from following the university's lead. Britain has a responsibility to apologize to the people of the Caribbean. It must repair the damage done to a region whose ancestors it brutalized in the trade in African peoples. We, the descendants, are still reeling from the legacies of colonialism. Despite approaches by Rastafari, civil society, and CARCOM heads of government, Britain and other countries have refused to own up to their wrongs and engage in a process of reparatory justice. But we know that the Vice Chancellor of the University of Glasgow, Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli, has carved out an honorable path, an example for others to follow. I laud both Sir Anton and Sir Hilary for having reached a successful conclusion to their months of discussion over how the University of Glasgow could engage the University of the West Indies in a reparatory justice conversation amid speculation and doubt. I must especially congratulate Sir Hilary for his tireless work in the area of reparatory justice. Whilst I'm aware that the strategy of implementation of this reparation package is still a live conversation, I welcome the signing of this MOU between these two universities. This signals that academic cooperation around issues of slavery and reparation is possible in the 21st century. Let this be an unforgettable moment in history. Thank you. I congratulate our Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Sir Hilary Beckles, and the University of the West Indies on the agreement which he has brokered is negotiated with a premier university in Scotland, the University of Glasgow, within the context of reparatory justice. As everyone knows, CARICOM, the Caribbean community, has established a Caribbean Reparations Commission to push the agenda for reparations, for repairing the legacy of underdevelopment, which we are suffering as a consequence of native genocide and the enslavement of African people in the Caribbean. CARICOM has established this commission headed by Sir Hillary, and there is a 10-point plan, and work is being done in every single country in CARICOM. Clearly, this work needs to be expedited, and it is necessary and desirable for us to be more proactive than we have been in the recent past, and that the political leadership across the region must demonstrate on an ongoing basis that this is a vital issue for our times. It is a great cause, and great causes have never been won by doubtful men and women. So that this particular program of educational cooperation and with financing done 
by the University of Glasgow is part and parcel of one of the dimensions of the 10-point plan on reparatory justice adopted by CARICOM. Winston, Vincent, and Grandines are heartened by the accelerated support and the bringing of the issue of reparations in the mainstream of politics in the United Kingdom, in other Western European countries, and certainly recently in the United States of America, including in the House of Representatives and on the campaign trail for the next presidential elections. In all of this, the University of the West Indies, CARICOM, the individual governments, and other important personalities, but certainly Sir Hillary himself, who has written and spoken extensively on this subject, researched it well. And this relatively small thrust in practical reparatory justice is to be supported, is to be applauded. It clears the pathway. It gives an indication as to what is possible. Remember, reparations for natives, then genocide and African slavery is not about handing money to individual descendants if they can be traced directly. It is about the community, the society benefiting to correct, to repair the legacy of underdevelopment brought about by native genocide and African slavery in our Caribbean. Thank you, and let's all keep the struggle up for reparatory justice. The scars of history. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to come in via video message to be able to wish you all the very best on the signing of this Memorandum of Understanding between the University of Glasgow and the University of the West Indies for the establishment of a joint institute of reparatory justice and Caribbean development. The truth is that no amount of time can erase the scars of history. We carry the memories in our hearts, we carry the memories in our brains. But the bottom line is we can always move forward and we choose to move forward when we begin to start the process of saying sorry and to begin to deal with the consequences of centuries of slavery, centuries of underdevelopment, centuries of colonialism. This is a start. When we start to understand that those things that we can research that affect our public health or constitute the obstacles to our development, once we start to research them, we can deal with them one by one by one. And this is what this process is about. The 20 million pounds which starts here may appear to some to be a small amount, but it is a significant sum in the journey. And we hope that the courage of the University of Glasgow will spill over to other institutions and to other governments to recognize that in the language of Earl Lovelace with his wonderful novel Saul, that we must begin by first acknowledging our wrongs and then seeking to correct them. This is critical in our journey. And those who engage in the process and the discussion of reparations understand that fundamentally the underdevelopment that has taken place in our societies has to be corrected. We take for granted when we look at others in the developed world that the wealth upon which their nations is built comes in large part from those of our ancestors who labored here. And we take for granted that the opportunities afforded their citizens are capable of being afforded because of those generations of wealth that have stabilized the conditions of their society. I look forward to our being able to have leaders of the region who can say that in the future, recognizing that our first responsibility to development will always be our own, but equally, the reality of the extraction of wealth from our region cannot be ignored. And therefore, we have to be able to remedy the consequences of that extraction of wealth 
over significant periods of time. I believe that this is a start in the right direction. I want to thank you, Sir Hillary, for your continued efforts and all who labor with you in the Caribbean and to recognize that this has almost been a journey of almost 20 years when I asked you to step into my shoes um, as leader of the Barbados delegation when I became Attorney General the day before and you so willingly agreed and led with distinction Barbados' delegation to the World Conference Against Racism. I feel this, I will work with you on this, and I have the absolute honor to chair the CARICOM Repository Committee with respect to these matters. I look forward, therefore, to being able to encourage others to follow the example of the University of Glasgow and to work in the vineyard on behalf of Caribbean people such that we can level the playing field once and for all in terms of opportunities and our development potential. God bless you all. Thank you. Is standing tall and is with us in the struggle for repatriate justice. Our thanks to Mrs. Susan Belgrave, trustee, British Foundation for the University of the West Indies. The Honorable Olivia Grange, CD, MP, Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport in Jamaica, and also the Minister who has Portfolio Responsibility for Reparation and for the National Council on Reparation. We've, we are always grateful to Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalves, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, for always being in the struggle. And of course, Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, and as you heard her say, Chair of the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparation. And so, as we transition from the MOU signing to the press conference, let me welcome those who have just joined us in the room and on live stream. We have just witnessed a historic moment, a demonstration of a step along the road to repatriate justice, proof that reparation is not a pipe dream. So more of us need to stand up and be counted. I now invite the Vice Chancellor and Dr. Duncan to reflect on the MOU and the mandate and activities for the proposed center before we give the floor to members of the media. So I start with the Vice Chancellor. Professor Shepard, uh, it is just to say that uh, we have been engaged in a conversation with our colleagues at the University of Glasgow for uh, over a year. Uh, in my own stead, I had an honor of being a part of their own internal deliberations. And in a sense, I was wearing two hats in the negotiation where I was uh, advising um, my Glasgow colleagues while at the same time um, engaging them in the bilateral uh, relationship. Um, it has been, um, for me, uh, an exciting journey to, to sit with colleagues at Glasgow and, and hear the sense of resolve uh, in the committee, uh, led by uh, David, with respect to this matter. Um, when you enter Glasgow as a city and you, and you look around and you walk around and drive around and you see all of the evidence of the transatlantic slave trade, the buildings, the names, the merchants' names and blazon on buildings, and you feel the history is alive. Uh, and when you enter the university, uh, Professor Anton, Vice Chancellor, and Davis Committee, and you feel that this historical knowledge is uh, fully understood, the consequences, and their determination to engage the past and the future. Uh, Glasgow is a very distinguished university. As you've heard, it's an, it's an ancient uh, university. It has a tremendous uh, history. Uh, but like all universities in Europe, uh, going through the colonial period, 
there, there was indeed this contradiction of the Enlightenment. Yes, there was Enlightenment, but the European Enlightenment also brought into being slavery. And the question, therefore, is what kind of Enlightenment could have created as a consequence the greatest crime uh, in the modern world? Um, but that is the contradictory nature of history, and we recognize those contradictions. We engage those contradictions, and, and, and David is correct. Glasgow University has a tremendous history of supporting progressive causes. Uh, he made reference to Adam Smith, who, whose classic work in 1776, I think it was, The Wealth of Nations, laid the foundation to establish that slavery was an uneconomical, inefficient system of production and brought modern economics into a progressive path. It is also true that they gave honorary degrees to Wilberforce uh, for his championing of the politics of abolition. I also believe to Clarkston, uh, is that correct? Did Clarkston, I think Clarkston also received an honorary degree uh, for drafting the first iteration of the Emancipation Bill. So it's a long history of progressive causes, and at the same time, uh, being caught up in the economic drift of slavery. And how you then untangle yourself from that becomes important, and this is the only way to do it, which is to acknowledge the circumstance and participate in repair. So for me, uh, a historian, and David is also a historian, I should tell you, don't mind the fact that he's responsible for the financial administration of the university. He's an historian, and he understands these things very, very well. So, uh, David, uh, working with you on this has been uh, an honor and a pleasure. There, there were moments when we had a little tit-tat, but I, I respected your cool and calm approach. And there was a moment, of course, when I became frustrated, and he sent me an email. He says, he says Hillary, um, I think we all have to step back and start again. <laughs> and, and we did, and here we are. Thank you, Davis. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sir Hilary. I'm not sure I have terribly much to, to add. It's fair to say that this hasn't been an easy process for the University of Glasgow. And you can see other institutions, other governments, wrestling with these issues, uh, writhing around, trying to work out how best to handle them, thinking about what the consequences of their actions will be. Um, I think it's been made easier for us by, as I said earlier, by the uh, professionalism of our academics, by the commitment of our senior management, but uh, most of all, perhaps, by the judicious advice that we've had from, from colleagues in the Caribbean and, and elsewhere. And I'd, I'd like to pay tribute to the role that Sir Hillary has played, both in negotiating with us, but also in advising us and, and walking that uh, tight line between the two roles so, so effectively. Um, I mean, looking ahead, uh, th there is a danger. Many universities go around the world signing uh, memorandums of, of understanding, and, and they're sometimes called NATO uh, agreements, no action, talk only. <laughs> and. Uh, we are absolutely determined as, as two universities that this will not be a NATO agreement, that it will be the beginning of a, of a real partnership. Uh, and, and to use Sir Hillary's phrase earlier, uh, we're not in the business of researching and running. This will be an enduring bond between the two institutions. The work really begins here. The challenge is to bring together uh, the great minds of our academics across the different disciplines to identify practical projects and collaborations that we can engage in, and also to, to win external funds. And there are funds to be, to be won that will be of real benefit uh, if we define the projects correctly uh, to the people of the Caribbean. So we're delighted to be here. We're delighted um, that uh, we've been able to sign this MOU today, and we look forward to working with you in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you both very much, Vice Chancellor and Dr. Duncan. But Dr. Duncan, if you think this VC will allow you to sign a NATO agreement, you have another guest coming. <laughs> so here we are at this stage of our morning's proceed proceedings. We are into the press conference now, and it is a press conference. I was asked by my media guides to tell you <laughs> that only members of the media will be allowed to ask questions. And I invite members, not just those in the room, but those who are in other, at other sites to ask questions. Mrs. Maxwell will alert me when there are questions from those who are off-site. Uh, 
uh, um, for the Vice Chancellor and Dr. Duncan. And what I will do is ask two questions in the room and then I go to um, our other colleagues and come back to you and so on. I want to appeal to you to really, if you want to ask a question, do just that. Don't make a statement, a speech, if you can help it, even though I'm sure they, those will be delightful. So I would like to find out who wants to start the ball rolling, which media house, yes, Mr. Oh, oh, I have, so, sorry, there was somebody ahead of you, I'm sorry, I've been told. Yes, uh, thank so, you. JNN. That's correct, Michael Shaw. Uh, Dr. Duncan, um, you've been told, that we're told that you're the figures man. Well, there's a figure here of 20 million. How did we get to this? Um, and since I want to go back to my post, uh, for you, um, Mr. Vice Chancellor, what do we tell the man on the corner? What does this represent to him or her? And of course, where do we go from here? I'll start with Dr. Duncan. I'm curious about the figure. <laughs> well, it, it was through a process of negotiation, I think it's fair to say. We, we discussed a, a number of possible figures and came up with what we thought was a realizable and achievable sum that was big enough, I suppose, to express the sort of the scale of the commitment that we uh, want to engage in. Um, but also not so big that it was impossible for the university to swallow. So if you like, it was uh, a process of, of winnowing down from larger, small figures and reaching something we thought was realizable. Yes, uh, thank you. And, and, and critically, it, 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 the 20 million has a ring to it for those of us in history because that was the sum that the British government had paid the slave owners. Um, the 20 million was the compensation to slave owners. So it's an interesting symmetry of, 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 num of numbers. But the man on the street, um, our approach to reparatory justice has always been about um, community transformation and empowerment. There are problems that are specific that have resulted from this legacy of slavery and colonization that are palpable in the Caribbean today. The, we take for granted um, uh, issues such as the endemic and persistent poverty in the Caribbean, that half of the black people in the Caribbean are, are trapped in these ghettoized structures around the region. And we take that for granted. We assume that the poverty is gripping and restricting the energy an imagination of Caribbean peoples is something that somehow is an act of God. These are historically designed structural consequences that we must confront. We must confront them and therefore, when this institute focuses on the economics of transformation, what is the cause of this extreme distribution of wealth in the Caribbean? How do we break through that in order to create development? The, all of the recent reports from the international agencies have said that what is crippling Caribbean economies is this maldistribution of wealth and income. Uh, the most extreme, among the most extreme in the modern world. We need to confront that if we're going to speak about development economics, so therefore the economists have to come to the table to speak about transformation, empowerment, social growth, not only economic growth, but the social growth of the people. So that is going to be a pillar of the Institute's work, so that the man on the street uh, is targeted as the beneficiary of any conversation that democratizes access to resources, better housing, better health, uh, the, the, the pandemic of chronic diseases that's ripping through the, the Caribbean. It has clear historical rules. It has to be confronted, has to be addressed. The man on the street has to be, again, the target and the focus of this kind of research. One of the projects that we're going to look at also is the, uh, the creation of a, an online slavery museum. Uh, this should interest those in humanities. How do we take all of the historical information about slavery and put it on a Caribbean global online museum where everyone can see everything. All of these images that you see on the screen, there are millions of them scattered around the archives in the world. All of this stuff needs to be placed in a central repository so that the man in the street, the child, the school teacher, everyone can study, can research, 
they can see for themselves what the historians have been aware of by going around the world pursuing archival research. So yes, it is a development vision that targets the ordinary person in the Caribbean whose ancestors have been the results of this long history that we are trying to address. So it is, it is not academic research as elitist activity. It's developmentally driven for social empowerment. Thank you. And we have a question from Jamaica Global Online. Uh, I have a question um, I'm sorry, Mr. Randall. If you could go to the mic, please. Mm -hmm. Good morning. This is a question for either Vice Chancellor or Dr. Duncan, and it's to ask about the um, proposed institute. Will there be a physical institute? And if so, where will it be located? This is something we've still to discuss, but uh, I think it will probably be, be uh, based across the, the two universities, so it will have uh, a presence with, with real human beings in the Caribbean on, on UWI campuses and also at University of Glasgow. And, and by the wonders of modern technology, hopefully colleagues will be able to, to bridge the transatlantic gap and, and work together on projects. So I think it, it will have a physical presence uh, across the two campuses, um, but we'll also make uh, heavy use of, of virtual means of communication. Yes, I think that's how we had imagined uh, an institute on both campuses, a director of the institute in, in each place and, and a board, a board that, uh, that manages the affairs of the, of the institute, which will be transatlantic. Uh, so it's uh, structurally a collaborat collaborative institutional process as well. Uh, from our perspective here at UWI, now that we have signed this MOU, my task is to take this agreement to our Finance and General Purposes Committee for its formal institutional recognition and then, of course, to uh, assign the relevant resources to enable it to function, space, staff, and so on. So it is, it is the beginning that, that triggers the structure of the institution. Thank you. Mrs. Maxwell, you have a question from our online viewers? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. We have a question here from Barbados today. While it was noted that other institutions were looking into the matter, of reparation, what are they, along with other organizations and authorities in the United Kingdom, saying in relation to the issue? How promising is it looking, and what indications are there of what steps they are likely to take? Okay, several questions. Over to you. <laughs> well, uh, maybe I should I should start with my alma mater, the University of Hull, that in 2007 receive um, a substantial grant from the British government to establish uh, the Wilberforce Institute for the Study of Slavery and Emancipation. And that was an interesting moment because the, the acronym of that is WISE. And when we formally launched that institute at 10 Downing Street uh, under the chairmanship of First Lady uh, Cheryl Blair, um, and I was asked to say a few words, and I said, wouldn't it have been better if we had named it the Wilberforce Institute for the Study of Slavery and Emancipation and Reparations, in which case the acronym would have been wiser. <laughs> but that proposal was not recognized at the time, and it is still wise, and I am still pushing for it to be wiser. Uh, then, of course, the University of London established the legacy the Legacies of Slavery Project, which was designed, again, with a grant from the British government to study what happened to the 20 million pounds that the slave owners received. And what that research has shown is that it was an enormous amount of money, 40% of British national expenditure for the year, 40% of gross national expenditure of the country was handed over to the slave owners enormous amount of money, 1834. And it was invested in the railways, 
and it led to the railway boom. Britain was able to fund a massive network of railways in the next 50, 60 years. That was funded out, a lot of it funded out of the reparations money. Okay. Agricultural modernization, urban development, and that money was plowed back into the British economy, leading to significant economic growth between the 1840s and the 1880s. So it really was a cycle of taking money from the treasury giving it to the slave owners, who then reinvested it back into the economy that generated growth and everyone became enriched in that cycle of economic transformation. But we, we did urge the University of London to take the next step, which is to say, well, you've done the research, you've demonstrated uh, how Caribbean wealth has been used again to promote British economic transformation, take the step towards reparatory justice, and they refuse. That, of course, led to a tension between myself and themselves. Professor Shepard was a part of that negotiation. I think she also went into a freeze relationship with London University. Two weeks ago, we were speaking with Bristol University. I met the Vice Chancellor, University of Bristol, to speak about this, because Bristol was the second largest slave trade in port in Great Britain. And the Vice Chancellor of Bristol and his team, they have agreed that they're going to now look at this matter very, very seriously with the point of view of starting their own reparatory justice program, and they will decide uh, how that will go. So we at uh, Cambridge University have just established a commission of inquiry, a, a commission of inquiry to look at how Cambridge University was also a part of this wealth extraction. So we will see how that will go. But the point is that Glasgow has moved into a space above and beyond all of those conversations that we have been having at the national university institutional level, and they have taken that philosophical step. We are not going to research and run. Mm -hmm. We are going to research, and then we are going to stand up and repair. And this is the fundamental difference. So let's hope that all of them eventually would, would come around to realizing that Excellent universities have to be ethical. And if you have an excellent reputation for your research and your scholarship and the dignity of the university, if there are unethical aspects surrounding that excellence, it does, in fact, uh, compromise a great deal of the language. So that is where we're at. Thank you very much. Yeah, if I may. Uh, Follow-up uh, question. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. it follows nicely on what he, he was saying. Uh, Dr. Duncan, I'm curious to get into your mind and um, to find what was it like for you personally um, and the Glasgow as you pursue this path. You know, we have had Mr. Cameron come to our parliament and tell us things that we didn't like. Um, this de denial, and uh, here we are today, you're not running, you're being ethical. And uh, what was, and I thank you very much, you know, Mr. Vice Chancellor, for the moments of um, not understanding each other sometimes, and you had to step back. So it wasn't a smooth road. But what were some of the challenges you had, resistance, if you may? Well, I'm very conscious of the fact that I don't want to, to sit here and, and say things that you don't like, like uh, <laughs> David, like the former Prime Minister, did. I mean, I think in all honesty, it, it, as I said earlier, it, it wasn't always an easy process because facing up to these sorts of issues uh, can be very uncomfortable for people. I think um, we made it easier by approaching it by using our own academic expertise. We had people who, who studied slavery, uh, the, the slave trade, the effect on enslaved people from a social history perspective, from an economic history perspective, people who have considered the consequences of slavery um, for different parts of the world over many years, and by tapping into that expertise, I think it made the process rather easier. Universities are academic institutions, after all. They're used to researching very difficult areas, and so grounding this project in that academic expertise, I think, uh, made, it, made it easier. Um, but of course, it's not just a, a project, a study of history, it's also about, about the present day. And uh, so trying to link up, I suppose, the academic expertise with the commitment of, of senior managers, particularly our, our principal and, and vice chancellor and the senior management group um, has, has been challenging. You know, academics and senior managers always work seamlessly, I would like to think, but uh, in reality, uh, th there can be pitfalls and challenges along the way. So I, I would say it, it, it hasn't been uh, an easy process, um, 
but it's been made easier by grounding it in, in academic expertise, by the external, external um, advice that we've been able to, to tap into and by the commitment of our senior managers. And, I mean, just to go back to the last question about what others are doing in the UK, um, th there is a sort of code amongst, an unwritten code amongst universities in this part of the world as well as I'm sure in the UK, that you don't tell others what to do. You know, one university doesn't tell another what to do. And if you do, then you very quickly um, uh, provoke an ab reaction. But nonetheless, there is a sort of moral economy. And, and that moral economy is influenced by people like uh, Silhiri and, and other voices around the world. And I think it's shifting. People are beginning to face up to some of the difficult issues in their past, like uh, the Cambridge study, for example. And I, I think we will see others moving in this direction over time. We're not going to preach to people. We're not going to tell them what to do. But as I said earlier, we're happy to share our expertise and, and the journey that we've been on. And perhaps some of them will go on that same journey too. Thank you. I'm sorry. The, the issue of, Shepherd, of the, the personal aspect. Um, we were discussing these dimensions last night. And it's not a coincidence that my middle name is MacDonnell. It, it speaks to the Scottish, the Scottish impact um, in our region through us. Neither is it a coincidence that I was born in a community in Barbados that is called the Scotland District. I mean, what are the chances of that? Um, that on an island, there is a place called the Scotland District because it's the pervasiveness of the Scottish presence in the Caribbean. I'm sure, I'm sure half of the people in this room who are Jamaicans carry a Scottish name somewhere. <laughs> um, because that, is that not right, Ian Randall? I mean, half of the people here, I mean, it's not a surprise that the, the former principal of this campus was also MacDonald, <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. Uh, but Scotland is right here in our midst. It's not, a, it's not in a distant past. It's all around us. Jamaica is, Jamaica is Scotland territory. Not surprising that the, the biggest bank in this country was Scotia Bank. People forget that. Scotia means the land of Scotland. That's what Scotia means. It is the land of Scotland. Nova Scotia means New Scotland. That's what Nova Scotia means. And Nova Scotia, New Scotland, is the biggest bank in this region. Still, a bank that originates out of the Scottish diaspora. And it's a dominant bank in our region. So we are, we are surrounded by New, New Scotland, and Nova Scotia is all around us. So Glasgow is just, Glasgow is just an institution within the global reach of Nova Scotia throughout the Caribbean. So it is, it is very much a contemporary and uh, a, a present reality. And by Only do we see the evidence around the sugar economy and the legacies of the sugar plantation, but we see that in terms of the bookkeepers, the managers, and those who owned livestock farms right across the, the region. I'm glad you mentioned Cambridge. I'm glad to know now that my two universities are engaged in this process. Um, Cambridge was in the news recently because my college just admitted men. Hooray! <laughs> that went down very well in Cambridge uh, the other day. So we have, Shakira, do you have another question for me? Do we have another question in the room? Um, any other media house in the room? I think the observer is here. No? Yes, okay. okay. All right. Okay. So, well, if there are no more questions uh, from the media, we will close. Let me just again thank you for being here to witness this historic moment. Thank you to the team from Glasgow, Dr. Duncan and Mr. Aitchison. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, and your team. Thanks, thanks to the planning committee, not just the planning committee in the vice chancellor's office, but the expanded team in the regional headquarters and across the Caribbean, um, especially in Barbados and in Trinidad and Tobago. Thanks to all those who joined us by live stream, and we hope to see big news later today as well as for the rest of this week. It is, after all, Emancipation Day tomorrow in many Caribbean countries, and it is fitting that we are gathered here at this moment. 
I end by saying may the reparation movement grow from strength to strength, and may European states who disfigured the Caribbean through the trafficking in enslaved African bodies, African enslavement, and colonialism follow the example of one of its oldest institutions and work with the Caribbean region to clean up their colonial mess. As some states that were colonized by Britain move to celebrate another Independence Day next month, may that former colonial power of Britain heed the words of Sir Ellis Clark, Trinidadian government's United Nations representative to a subcommittee of the Committee on Colonialism in 1964, an ancient date to many of you in this room, not to others. And I quote, an administering power is not entitled to extract for centuries all that can be got out of a colony. And when that has been done to relieve itself of its obligations by the conferment of a formal political independence, justice requires that reparation be made to the country that has suffered the ravages of colonialism before that country is expected to face up to the problems and difficulties that will inevitably beset it upon independence. Walk good, everyone. Thank you very much. And so we come to an end of a special insight where at the University of the West Indies Regional Headquarters, we saw the signing of the historic memorandum of understanding between the University of the West Indies and the University of Glasgow. The two universities have agreed to partner in a, a reparation strategy that focuses on how best to use this historical knowledge. In other words, they've studied, got the knowledge, and they're gonna do something about it. Under the terms of the MOU, the two Universities agreed to establish what is called as the Glasgow Caribbean Center for Development Research. The center through reparatory oriented uh, policy research will address the legacies of slavery and co colonialism. And there's money to this. Over the next two decades, UAG, that's the University of Glasgow, uh, will commit to spending some 20 million pounds as part of its program of reparative justice. And we thought this was so important today that this has been penned. This is what we're going to do with the knowledge. And here we are. And it is most interesting that we would have had this done today right here in Jamaica for those who suffered and still suffering from the colonial past. So on behalf of our technical and teams and all those who were viewing, we want to tell you continue watching JNN you will be able to see this again replayed and until next Wednesday all the best viewing from Insight. <laughs>